Well, how many of you remember listening to Paul Harvey on the radio? Anybody? How many of you wish he was still on the radio? I imagine he might have a lot to say today. But he passed away in 2009, but for over 50 years, Paul Harvey could be heard six days a week, twice a day, morning and afternoon, and at one point his broadcast reached 24 million people a week. He gave the news, of course. He began every broadcast with the same line. You remember it? Hello, Americans. Paul Harvey, stand by for news. Remember? He always ended with, Paul Harvey, awkward pause, good day. But he was perhaps best known for his famous segment called The Rest of the Story. He'd tell this long, rambling story in a sort of homespun way that would eventually show how some ordinary person, an ordinary American, played a significant role in some great event or great moment in our history. And he would finish with this signature line, and now you know the rest of the story. Now today we wrap up our series from the book of Ruth. And throughout this whole story, as we've gone week by week, scene by scene, the author, uh, time after time, lets us know that, there's a, that, that the story's not finished yet. That there's more to the story. That God is up to something bigger than we, than we can see at that moment in the story. Now, just a little bit of review. And so I'm going to quiz you, so don't be afraid to talk back to me here. Chapter 1. Elimelech takes his wife Naomi and their two sons to Moab because there's a famine in Israel. Both sons marry Moabite women and their names were Ruth and what's the other one? Orpah. Very good class. I always say Orpah is kind of like Oprah spelled sideways, but it's got two words mixed up there. And what happens in Moab? Elimelech dies. Both sons die. Very sad. Naomi decides to go back to Bethlehem, but we find out the story is not over because Ruth makes this surprising decision to stick with Naomi, her mother-in-law, and she goes back as a foreigner into Israel. Chapter 2, we meet a wealthy and influential man named Boaz, right? who happens to be a relative of Naomi's late husband, Elimelech, a special relative called a guardian. guardian redeemer, or some translations say kinsman redeemer. And he shows great kindness toward Ruth, allowing her to glean in his field and, and actually gives her enough to support Naomi as well. And he offers her protection. But the story doesn't end there either goes on to chapter 3. Naomi tells Ruth to do this strange thing, to offer herself to Boaz on the threshing floor, remember? She says after he gets done with the harvest and has had the wine and the feasting and he's lying down, go uncover his feet and lie down there. It sounds a little bit like something risque is going on, but it's not. We saw that that's a cultural thing. Naomi wanted Ruth to offer herself to her Redeemer, to redeem Ruth's life to marry her. And we see that Boaz says that he will do that, but first he has to check with this other man who has a closer relationship and really has first right of refusal to be the kinsman redeemer. But we find out the story doesn't end there either. In chapter 4, Boaz offers this other man the opportunity, but he declines. He's unwilling to pay the price of redemption, which opens the way for Boaz to redeem Ruth. Now, through it all, we've seen several themes week by week. First, we've seen the theme of this great Hebrew word hesed, which can be translated as loving kindness. We saw the, the extravagant kindness that Boaz offers to Ruth and to Naomi, which then reflects the very extravagant kindness of God himself. We saw the, we've seen the theme of faith, how uh, Ruth has faith when she says, I will travel with you away from my homeland to a place I've never been before because your people will be my people and your God will be my God. We see Ruth's faith in going to glean in the field of Boaz, trusting him not to harm her. We see Naomi's faith in telling Ruth to go offer yourself to Boaz because she believes the Redeemer will redeem. And Ruth's faith in surrendering herself to Boaz as her Redeemer. And we saw the theme of the guardian redeemer or kinsman redeemer, this unique idea in ancient Israel that the guardian redeemer was a blood relative who had the position and the, the responsibility to redeem, who had the resources to redeem, to buy back an entire family, and then the desire to redeem. Pointing, of course, to the promised redeemer who we know was still 
yet to come. Throughout the whole story, we've seen the themes of brokenness and redemption, how Ruth and Naomi each experienced devastating losses and faced hopeless futures, both eventually finding redemption through Boaz. And then overarching everything, we see the providence of God, who is overseeing the unfolding story in ways that the characters can't quite see, but we see from our perspective as God is constantly working in and through the story and in and through people and in and through faith to bring about his purpose of redemption. So that brings us to where we are today as we wrap up the final few verses of chapter 4, Ruth chapter 4. Let me read these to you and we'll comment along the way and see what we learn. Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. I'm going to stop there. The first thing we see in this portion is the redemption of Ruth. The redemption of Ruth. Uh, my first real romance happened when I was in college. Um, I fell for a girl, and for about two months, um, the entire thing was like a Coke commercial. You know, it was like, you know, the real thing. And uh, perfect, or at least so I thought. Uh, this was about five years or so before I met who, Lorene, who is now my wife. So it was only puppy love, but it seemed real to the puppy. And then one day, completely, <laughs> and then one day, completely out of the blue, she gave me the "Let's just be friends" talk. And guys, you, you know, if you translate that, you know what that means. I never want to see you again, right? But that's not the way she said it. She said, let's just be friends. Uh, so I was crushed. And, and if I could go back and talk to my younger self and give my younger self some good, wise advice, I would have said something like, you know, tough luck. That's kind of the way it goes. But just cut your losses and move on. Because this could be the very best thing that ever happened to you. But at that age, at that time, I didn't have that, that wise person advice. And so instead of just moving on, I kept trying to win her back. So a couple of months later, it was her birthday, and I made one more desperate attempt um, to restore and redeem that relationship by inviting her to dinner. So to my surprise, she, she said yes. I know now she just wanted a nice dinner, but then I was, I was still trying. So I, I made reservations at the, most, at the fanciest restaurant I could find near our school, um, hoping, of course, to impress her to redeem the relationship. And as I remember it, dinner was going... Well, she seemed to enjoy it. Food was good. You know, I, I'm being very encouraged. So we finish, and I go up to the, uh, take the tab and take it up to the counter to, to pay. She's standing right there. And as I take out my checkbook, this is 1977, so I didn't have a credit card. I was a college student. So I take out my checkbook, and the guy says, uh, sir, we don't take checks. <laughs> and at that moment, I, I saw her out of the corner of my eye. She backed up about three steps. And I leaned forward and said, I don't have any cash. I always pay with checks. And he said, I'm sorry, sir, we don't take checks, only cash and credit cards. I said, you have to take this check. <laughs> he saw my desperation. He said, let me talk to my manager. He walks away, and I'm trying not to make eye contact. He comes back, and I actually, he let me pay with a check, but I did not redeem that relationship. And by the way, it was the best thing that ever happened to me at that time. Uh, Ruth has been redeemed, we know, at this point, because Boaz was willing to pay the price of her redemption, right? And that should remind us of something. We, too, have a redeemer. Ruth has gone from being a foreigner, a Moabite, to being included in the people of Israel because she's been redeemed. That also should remind us of something. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes, You were once foreigners to the covenant of God. He's talking to us Gentiles. Without hope in the world, he says, now you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We have a redeemer. She's gone from being widowed to being married. She's gone from being barren, having no children, to giving birth to a son, becoming a mother. And notice the Lord gave her a son. And the key to Ruth's redemption is faith. Because she surrendered, she surrendered to her Redeemer. But the story isn't over. The second thing we see here is the redemption of Naomi. The redemption of Naomi. In my 
role as pastor, as all of you could imagine, one of the things I have the honor to do and privilege to do is to walk with people through times of loss. This past week, I shared in four different losses. Two, <coughs> excuse me, as an on-call chaplain at Del Nor Northwestern Hospital, um, on-call, um, on-call, and I go in, and two families lost uh, loved ones, uh, both uh, elderly, and then also with two Chapel Street families. Uh, Betty Metzger passed away. Uh, Betty was 94 years old, and Evelyn Johnson was 100 years old. Uh, in each case, families were grieving the loss of a loved one, and while their grief was real and deep and heartfelt, we don't really expect our loved ones to live past 80 or 90 years. So in some ways, we're kind of prepared when that time comes. But when it's the other way around, when it's a parent grieving the loss of a child, I've learned that it's still grief, but it's different. It's a different kind of grief. And walking with families through that kind of loss, including my own family, I've come to understand there is no greater loss than the loss of a mother of a child. Where Ruth lost a husband... Naomi lost her husband and both of her sons. She lost her entire future and the entire legacy of Elimelech's family line. But notice, the birth of a son to Ruth redeems Naomi's loss. Verse 14, Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. Now, this should remind us of something. Whose name became renowned in Israel? Whose name became famous in Bethlehem? Verse 15. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Now, Several things going on here. Uh, First, notice that even though Boaz married Ruth, and even though Ruth is the one who gave birth to a son, the women (coughs) have gathered around Naomi and they're celebrating the redemption of Naomi. They say, blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer. Why do they celebrate like this? Well, because they knew what it was like to have no children. To have no children in that world at that time was to be cursed. It was to be left without hope. It was to have no one to provide for you, no one to care for you. It was to be left destitute. And this son, born to Ruth, is going to redeem Naomi by being, first of all, a restorer of life. The birth of a son here ensures the continuation of a family line that had died in Moab with her two sons. He says, and a nourisher of your old age. The son will be able to provide for her as he grows up and begins to take care of her into her old age. Now notice, this child means that Naomi has not been forgotten. That she has a family. She has a hope. The women say, you have a daughter-in-law who loves you, who's more to you than seven sons. Now what does that mean? Well, sons were valued in the ancient world. Uh, Having a son meant one was wealthy and blessed. And seven sons would have been the ideal or the idea of a perfect family. Now remember where Naomi has been. Way back in chapter 1, after she suffered the loss of her husband and the loss of both of her sons, Naomi said in verse 20 and 21, Don't call me Naomi, she she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. But now, there's a celebration because she has been redeemed from bitterness to joy, from emptiness to fullness, from afflicted to blessed by God, from the death of a family line to life. And the key to Naomi's redemption is also faith. Faith in her Redeemer. She was the one who told Ruth, Go and offer yourself to Boaz at the threshing floor. And notice here as well, the son, the one born to Boaz and Ruth, is going to take Boaz's place as the Redeemer. The son becomes her Redeemer. And that should also remind us of something. But the story doesn't end here either. Thirdly, we see the redemption of generations. 
the redemption of generations. For several years now, Chapel Street has had a Serve the World partner <coughs> excuse me, in Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates. I'll leave that photo on just for a minute. It's one of the most strategic regions in the Middle East. Um, about four years or so ago, Pastor Bruce McAvoy and I made a trip there and um, learned that Dubai is a really interesting, interesting place. Um, it looks like a high-tech city from a James Bond movie dropped right into the middle of a desert. Uh, we went to the top of the Burj Khalifa. That's the, that tall, skinny thing you see in the back. That's the tallest building in the world. It looks like a pretend building, like nobody could build something that really looks like that. It's 2,700 feet high, and it's 163 stories. We went up to the top of that. We also did something called dune bashing, which is basically careening around the sand dunes um, in jeeps uh, and putting your life at risk. But that was kind of fun. But the, partner, the purpose of this particular partner is to reach the Muslim world with the good news of the gospel. And one of the people we met there was a 29-year-old man named Amir. Now, Amir is not his real name. I, I need to protect his identity because of the work that this group does. Now, Amir was a Muslim background believer, that is, a follower of Jesus. Born and raised in Bahrain, in a family where his mother and father were Muslim, and he was completely immersed in Islamic culture. One day, Amir was driving us around the city, and Bruce asked him to share the story of how he came to be a follower of Jesus. We assume, assuming it would be an interesting story, and it was. He told us that even though his family was Muslim, his grandfather had converted to Christianity as a young man in Saudi Arabia. And then it felt called by God to go to Bahrain as a kind of medical missionary. He was some form of a doctor. I no longer remember what. And he spent the next 40 years of his life trying to share the gospel of Jesus. And Amir said that in all those 40 years, his grandfather didn't see a single person come to faith in Jesus in 40 years. In fact, even his wife returned to Islam, and all seven of his children became Muslim. But Amir said he loved his grandfather, and loved it especially when he would come and visit because of the stories he would tell him at bedtime and other times. Amir's mother, who by that time was a devout Muslim, forbid her father, his grandfather, from ever talking about Jesus in their home or even bringing a Bible into their home. And whenever, um, but whenever his grandfather would visit, he would tell these stories. And eventually, when Amir was about 13 or so, his grandfather died. And that was a devastating blow to him. And that, along with some other things, um, led Amir into a really dark time in his life as a young teenager. Became rebellious. Um, he was angry. Uh, started drinking and did some, did some drugs, all kinds of stuff. And he missed his grandfather this whole time. But during that time, he would still remember the stories his grandfather would tell, how they made him feel. And then somehow, I don't remember how, he got a hold of a Bible. And he began to read the Bible secretly, hiding it from his family. And it dawned on him as he read the New Testament that his grandfather had been telling him all those years veiled stories of Jesus, sort of in code. Uh, and he said they were, they were all right there. He knew these stories. But his grandfather changed him just enough not to get in trouble with his daughter. And on his own, just through reading the New Testament, Amir became a follower of Jesus. Now I want you to hold that story just for a moment. Verse 17 we see, And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. That's odd. Ruth actually gave birth to the son. But this is in the whole big picture of the story. They named him Obed. Now this is a little bit weird. What does it mean that the women gathered around named the child of Ruth? Celebrating Naomi. It's all kind of confusing. Well, it's unclear whether the women are actually giving a name, which wasn't their right to do, or saying, in effect, you ought to call him, or maybe they're celebrating what they've already decided to call him. Either way, his name is Obed, and it means a servant who worships in Hebrew. Then he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, we can read that, and we don't feel anything, really. Interesting. But if a Jewish audience at, that, at, at any point in history reads this, there would be an out loud gasp. <gasps> because this is a Paul Harvey moment. This is like the rest of the story moment. A child born to Ruth the foreigner and Boaz the redeemer, Naomi's grandson, would eventually grow up to be the grandfather of King David himself, the greatest king in the history of Israel. But as breathtaking as that is, the story isn't finished. Verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. We'll talk about Perez in just a minute. 
Perez fathered Hezron, and Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, and Salmon fathered Boaz, and Boaz fathered Obed, and Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Now here we're getting to the rest of the story, beginning with Perez. You remember who Perez was? Genesis chapter 38. Perez is born as the result of a union, a sinful union, a sordid union between Tamar and her father-in-law Judah. It's a sordid story. You can read it in Genesis 38. So why is he even mentioned here? Why the list of names? Well, genealogies mattered in the ancient Jewish world. They told you about the significance of a person, either their ancestors or that you were made important by who came out of your family tree. So we come toward the end of the story of Ruth, and we finally start to see why this little love story is in the Bible. This is the family tree of King David. And now we start to see that God has been up to a greater redemption all the way along, a greater redemption than Ruth and Naomi. He's been redeeming an entire family tree for his purpose. But it's even bigger than King David. If we jump ahead to the very beginning of the New Testament, beginning with the first verse of the Gospel of Matthew, here's what we read. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David. Hint there. The son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now pause there. Tamar uh, was the foreign daughter-in-law of Judah, who tricked him into having a son with her. But her name is in this genealogy. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. We've heard this before. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Another surprising name. Remember who Rahab was? Anyone? Yep. She was the prostitute of Jericho, a Canaanite woman, another foreigner, who allowed two Israelite spies to hide under a roof while they were spying out the land. And as a result, she and her family were spared in the battle, and she eventually married into the family line. Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, we already know through our study, Ruth was another foreigner, a Moabite woman, a widow redeemed by Boaz. So three foreign women listed in this genealogy the family tree, very significant. We'll come to that in a minute. Obed, the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Who was Uriah's wife? Bathsheba, right? Remember, the woman with whom King David had the illicit affair, the greatest sin of his life. They bore a son. She's now married into the family tree as well. An embarrassing moment in the, in the history of Israel. And then Matthew gives us 24 more generations. I'm going to skip those. We'll read you all those names. We finally get to Matthew 1, verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And now you know. It's another Paul Harvey moment. Do you see it? This is the story of salvation. This is why the story of Ruth is in our Bible. This is the family tree, not just of King David, but of Jesus the Messiah. And that's not all. I pointed out that this, that this genealogy includes the names of five women. Very unusual in an ancient patriarchal culture to mention the women. Five women. Even more unusual that each of these five women have something about them that would have made it embarrassing to include them in a family tree. Tamar, foreigner seduced her own father-in-law. Rahab, a prostitute who came to faith in the God of Israel. Ruth, a Moabite, redeemed by Boaz. Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, had an illicit affair with King David. And Mary had an out of wedlock pregnancy that we know now was from God himself. But at the time, there were lots of rumors. Now here's the point for us. It's that God redeems. He redeems. He's used Boaz to redeem Ruth and then to redeem Naomi, and to redeem the entire family tree of King David. And he's used that family tree that includes foreigners, Gentiles, that's us, that includes lots of broken and twisted branches, that could be us as well, to bring about the purpose of his redemption. And now we are the ones who should gasp. Because here we see 
the fourth thing I see in this story, which is the redemption of the world. The redemption of the world. Back to that story of the guy I met in Dubai named Amir. Amir told us that shortly after he became a secret Christian, his mother found the Bible he had hidden under his bed. She flew into a rage and started choking him on his bed. He was only 14. She was choking him. He realized that she was trying to kill him, his own mother. And so he couldn't escape from her, and so he pretended to pass out, and she left him for dead. This actually happened twice within a year in his own home, till finally he had to flee his home for his own safety. But even though his mother had tried to strangle him, Amir kept reading his Bible and he kept growing in his faith. Eventually, his younger brother got sick, some sort of heart condition. I don't really remember what it was. But his mother, in her desperation, because nothing was helping, doctors didn't know what to do, nothing was helping, she came to the son she tried to choke, Amir, and she asked him to pray to his Jesus for his brother. So Amir was shocked, but he did. He prayed for his brother, and over time, the brother's condition improved, and eventually the doctors said he was healed, healthy. Through that experience, Amir's mother came to faith in Jesus, then his father, then his brother, and his entire family, and today, his mother, the one who tried to choke him to death twice, is now an evangelist of the gospel. Let's go back to Amir's grandfather for a moment. Forty years without a single person coming to faith in Jesus that he knew of. All seven of his children becoming Muslim. He died thinking his life and his faith was a complete failure. But he didn't know the rest of the story. God was working to redeem. God used the stories he told to his grandson to redeem, and then through his grandson to redeem his daughter, and then through his daughter to redeem the whole family, and then who knows how many countless people through her preaching and her testimony. Now here's the message of the book of Ruth. Have you experienced loss or brokenness or bitterness? The story isn't over. Have you ever felt far from God? story isn't over. God redeems. Are there broken and twisted branches in your family tree? Do you have a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter or a friend who's far from God? The story's not over. There is a redeemer, the story tells us. There is one who redeems you, your sin, your failures, your losses, your brokenness, who pays the price of redemption. There is one who is willing to redeem an entire family tree because God is up to something much bigger than we can see from our perspective. And God is something, something much bigger in your life and your family tree than you could even imagine. That's the story of Ruth. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this ancient story, a story from a different time, a different place, yet a story in which we can indeed find ourselves. Thank you for being a God who redeems reaches into our pain and loss, even our sin, with your hesed kindness, your grace, to bring healing, hope, and new life. And today, as we come to your table with this bread and cup, remind us again of the promise of your redemption. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.